French Broad Baptist Church family. Pastor Joshua here, and we are so excited that you've chosen to join us this week for online church. I know it's been hard not being able to come together in physical form, but it's been amazing to see the responses that we're getting through this virtual church, through this online church church. This is a new avenue that we're exploring, and we're so happy that you've chosen to partner with us as we go down this avenue. We believe that the Lord is changing lives through these online services. I've heard so many great things, so thank you for being a partner in that. We're glad you joined us this morning. Please gather the whole family around, and let's worship the Lord together through song and through the Word. Share this message with you anybody you know that might need something encouraging this week because we serve a God who is still changing lives and who is still the light of the world. Share this message, let your friends and family know, but we're just super glad that you chose to join with us this week. states, the eternal God is your refuge, and underneath are the everlasting arms. It was this very verse that came to the mind of Anthony J. Showater in 1887 when he was trying to write to friends to comfort them after a time of loss. He realized this would be a really great hymn, so he began to write the refrain for leaning on the everlasting arms. He enlisted his friend who was a pastor and hymn writer to compose a verse, and the great hymn of our faith was born. We usually sing it in a rousing kind of version, declaring the joy of our fellowship with God and with each other. But during this time, it's kind of taken on a new meaning. And it was born out of a time of sorrow and reflection. So when we sing it together, let's truly declare it that we are leaning on the everlasting heart.
Hey friends, we just want to take a quick moment now to pray for everything that's going on in our world, for everything that's going on around us, and to ask that the Lord would speak to us this morning through worship and his word. So let's pray together. Lord Jesus, we come before you, thanking you for the opportunity we have as a church family to worship you through this video, through the internet, to come together as one. We pray for the medical workers. We pray for the staff that are working in multiple places that are called essential. We're praying for everyone who may be exposed to the virus. We're praying for everyone who's suffering from it right now. Lord, we know your hand is in this, and we know that you're a God who loves and a God who heals. And we're asking right now that your glory would shine through this video, that we would see how good you are and how gracious you are. We're asking that we would take this time, hear your word, and apply it to our lives, that we might shine your light wherever we go. And we pray it in Jesus' name.
Church Broad friends. How good it is to see you, if only by video, here this morning. You know, uh, a few months ago I was in the U.S. cellular store and I asked the young lady there, uh, where do you worship? And she said, Bedside Baptist. And I said, Bedside Baptist, where is that? She said, yeah, you know, my church just streams its services and I just roll over and turn on my computer and I worship right there in my bed. It won't be long before all of us may be saying we worship at Bedside Baptist. It is good to see all of you and I'm really glad that you've taken the time to join us. You know our staff has been working so hard uh, together to make possible for us to stay connected and I really appreciate so much uh, each and every one of them and all the hard work that they have done uh, to help us stay connected during this time and we are praying for you. We're praying for your family we're praying over your home that God will bless and keep and protect you. You know, Dan Brown, a friend of mine here in the church, he uh, shared a poem with me recently. And maybe some of you have seen it. It's made its way around uh, social media here for some time. Uh, and, and I just love, uh, I think it captures so well the time that we're in. Uh, it's been attributed uh, to an author named Kitty O'Meara. And uh, let me just share it with you, if I may. It says this, and the people stayed home and read books and listened and rested and exercised and made art and played games and learned new ways of being and were still and listened more deeply. Some meditated, some prayed, some danced, some met their shadows and the people began to think differently and the people healed. And in the absence of people living in ignorant, dangerous, mindless, and heartless ways, the earth began to heal. And when the danger passed, and the people joined together again, they grieved their losses, and made new choices, and dreamed new images, and created new ways to live, and heal the earth fully as they had been healed. You know, ordinarily today on Palm Sunday, we would have gathered here at church and the choir uh, would have sang and the musicians would have played and the story of our Savior's love and sacrifice would have been told. But today, we stayed home. These are not ordinary times, are they? I have struggled with that and wondered how is God working through his church when it is scattered about and not gathered together in a time when everything seems to be diminished or less than. Esau Macaulay wrote in a recent article to the Times News or to the New York Times. He wrote these words and I thought they were quite insightful in our present times. He said, there's a lesson here for the diminished church. It is not that the church should go away forever, but that the heroic virtue comes in small actions as much as in large ones. We live in an age of self-assertion where everyone is yelling, pay attention to me because I'm the only one who can help. The part of the Christian message is that God comes to us in ways that defy our expectations. The all-powerful empties himself of power to become a child. Jesus, as king, does not conquer his enemies through violence. He converts them to his cause by meeting violence with sacrificial love. He goes on to say, the church's absence, its literal emptying, can function as a symbol of its trust in God's ability to meet us regardless of the location. The church remains the church whether gathered or scattered. It might also indirectly remind us of the gift of gathering that we too often take for granted. Well, I tell you, as I read those words, I thought, I hope and pray that we do not take for granted ever again the ability to be able to gather together. And as I read that quote, I thought, yes, God can and does meet us regardless of our location. He can and does meet us and find us in the most unusual of places. Today we will learn about that very thing together. In Judges chapter 6, if you have a Bible, you want to go ahead and grab it. Turn to Judges chapter 6. It's in the Old Testament. And you'll find uh, this book 
uh, is a history of Israel after the people of God have taken up residence in the promised land of Canaan. And Judges details the story of repeated periods of time when God's people follow Him and worship Him wholeheartedly and live under His protection and blessing, followed by times when the next generation will turn away from God and follow other gods and uh, immerse themselves in the culture and pagan ways around them. Human nature hasn't changed very much over time. But thankfully, God, uh, the God of all creation who has created us, still knows our needs and cares for us, even when we go astray. This morning, let's look at Judges chapter 6. And there's a very important question in there that I want us to look at and wrestle with for just a moment together. Uh, it's not on your screen, but let me share it with you uh, as I read it this morning. Judges chapter 6, verses 1 through 10. The Israelites did evil in the eyes of the Lord. And for seven years he gave them into the hands of the Midianites. Because the power of Midian was so oppressive, the Israelites prepared shelters for themselves in mountain clefts, caves, and strongholds. Whenever the Israelites planted their crops, the Midianites, Amalekites, and other eastern peoples invaded the country. They camped on the land and ruined the crops all the way down to Gaza and did not spare a living thing for Israel, neither sheep nor cattle nor donkeys. They came up with their livestock and tents like swarms of locusts. It was impossible to count them or their camels. They invaded the land to ravage it. Midian so impoverished the Israelites that they cried out to the Lord for help. When the Israelites cried out to the Lord because of Midian, he sent them a prophet who said, This is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says. I brought you up out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. I rescued you from the hand of the Egyptians. And I delivered you from the hand of all your oppressors. I drove them out before you and gave you their land. I said to you, I am the Lord your God. Do not worship other gods, nor the gods of the Amorites, in whose land you live. But you have not listened to me. Thankfully, the story doesn't end there. Let's make a few observations just from that passage uh, that I'll share with you this morning. The condition, first of all, of God's people is this. They are doing evil in God's sight. Here's the thing. All of life is lived in God's sight. Secondly, the culture and the people surrounding them, the Midianites, the Amalekites, uh, those uh, with, or, with whom they were living, were so oppressive and they had no regard or little regard for human life at all. Thirdly, and interestingly, it took seven years of desolation and destruction and depletion before the people of God cried out to him for help. And I wondered, why was that? Why does it take so long? When they did cry out, God sent first a messenger, a prophet to begin the process of help. You know, God always begins with the spiritual needs of people. Yes, they were starving. Yes, they were in hiding. Yes, they are impoverished and completely depleted and devoid. But God starts the healing and helping process by reminding them of who he is, of what he has done for them in the past, and that it was they who have disobeyed and disrupted the relationship with him. But God doesn't leave them there. Let me tell you something about God. The story never ends with the God of heaven leaving his people in a place of condemnation and guilt. He is a loving rescuer and redeemer and restorer of all those who call on his name. Even when they have gone astray. And he's always faithful and will send help to anyone who reaches out to him in sincerity. So never, ever forget that. So what does God do? When you read through the Bible, you'll find that sometimes God works miracles and it's done. But more often than not, God chooses to work through ordinary people. He chooses a man or a woman who will listen to and obey and then God works through that individual's life to bring about the change that's needed and necessary in a given situation. In our scripture today, that young person 
That it is a young man named Gideon. And God sends a messenger, an angel of the Lord, to Gideon. Now, he was hiding from the, Midian, uh, from the Midianites. Uh, he was trying to thresh enough grain, uh, wheat, for his family. And to this young, unlikely leader, whom God will ultimately use to restore and rescue uh, Israel, the Lord sends this message. Read with me there in verse 12. It's on your screen. When the angel of the Lord appeared to Gideon, he said, The Lord is with you, mighty warrior. And Gideon says, notice Gideon's very spiritual response. Pardon me, my Lord, Gideon replied, but if the Lord is with us, why has all this happened to us? Does that question sound familiar to you? Where, Gideon says, are all his wonders that our ancestors told us about when they said, did not the Lord bring us up out of Egypt? But now the Lord has abandoned us and given us into the hand of Midian. Questions are good. When I was in elementary school, my teachers used to say, there are no bad questions, only the ones you do not ask. So please ask your questions. Along the way, many have been told it's not good to question God. But let me tell you something. God is big enough to handle your questions and my questions. And when Gideon said, if the Lord is with us, then why has all this happened to us? God had an answer. And sometimes, do you know this? You may be the answer to your own question. God may be ready to work through your life or through my life to bring about the change, to bring about the need that you and I are questioning God about in the moment. Verse 14, then the Lord turned to him, that is to Gideon, and said, it's there on your screen, go in the strength you have and save Israel out of Midian's hand. Am I not sending you? Verse 15, pardon me, my Lord, Gideon replied, but how can I save Israel? My clan is the weakest in Manasseh and I am the least in my family. Maybe Gideon uh, was the youngest in his family or maybe he was not such a, a big, strong warrior after all. But listen to what God says to him. The Lord answered, verse 16, I will be with you. And you will strike down all the Midianites, leaving none alive. God said to you, you will have victory, not because of your own strength, but because I will be with you. Does it make a difference whether God is with you? Absolutely it does. What happens here? is a very humbling and deeply life-changing encounter with God. Gideon's faith grows, not all at once, but rapidly over a few days. And God's first assignment for him is a big one. Gideon is not to go and take on the Midianites and their army, but to go home and make things right spiritually. It's an interesting first assignment that God gave to him. The first thing God has him to do is to go home to his father's house and tear down the altar to the pagan uh, god Baal and the Asherah pole beside it. And getting rid of these symbols of pagan worship and the degrading practices that they represented were the first order of business as evidence that Gideon was all in with the God of heaven. He was not only to tear them down, but he was to build up a proper altar and offer true worship to the God of heaven. And Gideon obeys and does so, but he does it at night because he's afraid. Listen, you can be afraid and still obey. Here's what I thought and I, as I reflected on this. The first step in the healing and restoring of a nation is a decisive return to God in the homes and hearts of the people who make up that nation. National change will not come when the homes of the land in that nation are spiritually complacent or depraved. The first step in the healing and restoring of a nation is a decisive return to God, one family at a time, and everything else will follow. That's the hinge on which hope turns and healing comes. If you read the rest of the story, Gideon does gain victory over the oppressive Midianite enemy and the nation of Israel is ultimately rescued and restored to a period of, of peace that lasted some 40 years. 
Wouldn't it be great to have a period of peace in our nation that lasted 40 years? God always delivers his people when they cry out to him. We humans, we can get in a mess sometimes, can't we? God knows that. He knows that left to ourselves, we will choose wrong over right unless we have help. And so God did something to help us. Rather, he sent someone to help us. He sent his son, Jesus. John 3, 16 through 18 says it this way. It's on your screen. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. It's important during times like this and all times to remember that life is not just for here on earth, but life is for eternity. And God always acts in view of eternity, and he knows our need, our greatest need. Verse 17 says, For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. This is not on your screen, but verse 18 goes on to say, Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe stands condemned already because they have not believed in the name of God's one and only Son. See, God sent Jesus to save us, not to condemn us. He sent Gideon to save Israel, and he sent his Son to save us. This morning we face a spiritual pandemic as well as a medical pandemic that is ravaging our land. We are in need of help and hope. We are in need of healing, not just medically, but also spiritually. And you say, well, pastor, how will that happen? Well, one idea shared at a time when our nation was in trouble, ravaged not by disease, but by war, civil war. Thousands were dying. Our president at the time wrote a proclamation calling for a day of national prayer and fasting and humility. Listen to these words. We have been the recipients of the choicest bounties of heaven. We have been preserved these many years in peace and prosperity. We have grown in numbers, wealth, and power as no other nation has ever grown. But we have forgotten God. We have forgotten the gracious hand which has preserved us in peace and multiplied and enriched and strengthened us. And we have vainly imagined in the deceitfulness of our heart that all these blessings were produced by some superior wisdom and virtue of our own. Intoxicated with unbroken success, we have become too self-sufficient to feel the necessity of redeeming and preserving grace, too proud to pray to the God who made us. It behooves us then to humble ourselves before the offended power to confess our national sins and to pray for clemency and forgiveness. Those words were penned by the President Abraham Lincoln in April of 1863. How we need healing spiritually, how we need hope, medically and physically, will you join me this morning in praying that the God of heaven will meet us right where we are and lead us victoriously into a place of peace and healing. Will you pray with me? Oh Lord our God, we need your help today. We confess that we are without answers and without hope unless you save us. Lord, may we today tear down the altars that hinder our worship and wholehearted devotion to you alone. May we individually and collectively, and in view of your great love for us, declare once again our love and devotion to you alone. And may this start at my house and our houses and our homes and our community right here in Hendersonville. And may we, O oh God, receive your spirit, the spirit of Jesus, our Savior. Will you raise up ordinary heroes in our day to defeat this medical pandemic that is consuming our land? Will you give extraordinary knowledge and courage and wisdom and insight to ordinary men and women that they may have endurance to help others to find hope 
in our day, but will you also raise up ordinary spiritual heroes who lead us, I pray, back to you. Will you make us different because of this season? Will you make us better and not bitter when this time has passed? May we, O oh God, receive your help, your hope, your healing, even as we share that with those around us today in our homes and in our communities. We pray this in Jesus' name, amen and amen. Thank you, and may God richly bless you.